day, everyone, uh, all around the world. Um, I am Dr. Van der Wetering, and the moderator of this um, webinar this afternoon, and it will be on ototoxicity, will be presented by Dr. Mari van der Heuvel and Dr. Annelotte Meijer. I have known Professor van der Heuvel for a very long time already, a dedicated pediatric oncologist, um, and she's been working um, from 2015 onwards in this new uh, Princess Maxima Center, um, and is now responsible for established centralized care and a translational research program as PI. Um, for all children with renal tumors, but she's also excellent in identification of genetic determinants of direct and late toxicity. She is in many steering committees all over the world, and um, I can fill another half hour with mentioning all these steering committees. But I'm very pleased that uh, Mari is on this webinar this afternoon. And then uh, Annelotte Meyer, who, um, who has just done her PhD on autotoxicity in, um, in September 2021. Um, she's a very dedicated uh, researcher and is now a postdoc researcher at our um, hospital at the Princess Maxima Center. Um, she um, did a pre-master in master health sciences in the FU University and uh, ended her master's in the Institute for Public Health and Environment. Um, we are very proud that Anlo did all this work and she can present it very nicely. So please, Mari and Anilot, can you present? Thank you for the kind introduction, Dr. Van der Weesring. And uh, before you, you begin, I would like also to welcome everyone to this seminar and thank you, Maria, uh, Marianne van der Wettering, for uh, introducing uh, you both. And we are very happy to go on with the seminars of the Istanbul University Oncology Institute in Preventive Oncology, which are all endorsed by SIOP uh, and by SIOP the supportive care, you know that Ma Ma uh, Marianne van der Wettering is uh, one of the founders of the SIOP supportive care committee. And uh, this, uh, the topic today, autotoxicity is very, very important and we'll be commemorating van der Wettering and uh, very uh, uh, experienced two speakers will be talking about autotoxicity. I also have invited Penelope Brock, dear Dr. Brock, thank you so much for being with us. At the end, we will have your comments as well. Uh, and thank you for all for participating. So now we can go on with the talks. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, can everyone hear me well? Okay, great. So uh, thank you again for the opportunity to present here today. Um, we, uh, today we would like to present to you an overview of our studies on the determinants of autotoxicity in children and adolescents with cancer, including future challenges. Um, so sitting next to me is Professor Van der Heuvel. Would you introduce yourself, please? Please go ahead. Oh, okay. Well, I can introduce her as well. Um, uh, Dr. Van der Wettering already mentioned it a little bit, but um, Professor Van der Heuvel studied medicine at Utrecht University and then thereafter did her residencies um, amongst others in the Erasmus Medical Center in Rotterdam, uh, Garcelon, the UK and uh, St. Jude in uh, USA. Thereafter she was a senior staff member and associate professor at the Erasmus Medical Center and she obtained her PhD in 2001. And um, well, uh, then um, Professor Van Heuvel was transferred to the um, uh, Princess Maxima Center, um, which was established in 2014. And she is Professor of Translational Pediatric Oncology at the Maxima since 2016. She uh, holds two research lines, one in renal tumors, um, and one of her uh, main tasks is that she's the chair of the SIOP RTSG committee. Um, she also holds a research line on to toxicity, 
uh, autotoxicity is an important one, but she also uh, does research on gonadal damage, uh, renal bone and dexamethasone related toxicity, metabolic syndrome, and also focuses on cancer in pregnancy outcomes. What's very important is that she built a unique uh, late effects clinic in our center. Uh, so I uh, studied health sciences at uh, Veel University Amsterdam, and uh, I obtained my master's degree in 2017, um, specialized in infectious diseases and epidemiology and statistics. And after I obtained my master's degree, I uh, reached out to uh, Professor van der Heuvel, and um, well, I started my uh, PhD in her group, um, main focus on clinical and genetic risk factors for autotoxicity, uh, which I will uh, tell you more about uh, during uh, this talk. Uh, I'm involved in several autotoxicity research uh, groups, uh, such as Banker Life, uh, Autotoxicity Task Force, uh, Saipen, Saipel, etc. And I'm cur currently working as a postdoc, um, and I'm continuing our uh, projects, and I'm writing grant applications, I supervise PhD students, etc. And this is actually uh, one of my favorite pictures of us uh, during my PhD defense uh, last year. Um, so that was really, uh, really a nice day. So then a um, little bit uh, about childhood cancer in general. Um, uh, overall, about uh, 300,000 children uh, suffer from cancer each year. And in the Netherlands, we uh, treat about 600 patients per year. And as you know, the survival rates have increased uh, tremendously over the past decades, currently uh, reaching up to uh, 75 to 80 percent. So uh, a little bit about pediatric oncology in the Netherlands before uh, the Princess Maxima Center was established. Um, research and care were very scattered across uh, the country. We had um, seven hospitals in the Netherlands who were treating children uh, with cancer. Uh, there was increased uh, knowledge, but it wasn't uh, shared between uh, hospitals and also treatment focused on small patient groups. And, um, yeah, there were big research investments that were not integrated in care, but I think worst of all, the survival curves were flattening. That was why uh, uh, parents uh, of uh, children with cancer and pediatric oncologists uh, took the initiative to establish one treatment center for all malignancies. So we went from seven uh, centers to one new hospital, literally in the center of the Netherlands. And here we have the um, combined expertise of medical specialists and scientists together. Um, so in the Princess Maxima Center, um, we uh, do the complex care and research, but the shared care hospitals um, still do the less complex care. The mission of the Princess Maxima Center is to provide a cure and optimal quality of life for every child with cancer. Um, and we um, hope by close collaboration of uh, care and research that the uh, survival rates will increase and the adverse events will decrease. We became an independent organization in 2014 and we started with treatment of children with solid tumors in 2015. Thereafter, the, our uh, building was constructed, uh, it was between 2016 and 2018. Um, and then our grand national opening by uh, our queen, as you can see here in the picture, was on June uh, 5th, 2018. And then we started uh, to treat uh, patients with all cancer types except, except for retinoblastoma. So uh, as I mentioned, um, uh, we, now, we focus on increased survival rates, but also um, hopefully a reduction in uh, side effects of treatment. And one of the important direct and late effects of treatment is autotoxicity. And this is characterized by uh, hearing loss, but also tinnitus, known as ear ringing, and vertigo, also known as dizziness. So um, to explain about the uh, mechanism of autotoxicity, uh, I use this very en uh, enlarged cross-section of the ear. Here you can see that the sound waves enter um, the outer ear, the ear canal, the splatter number one. And here they enter the tympanic membrane in the middle ear in number two. And here the sound waves are transferred to the cochlea, also known as the inner ear, and specifically to the hair cells. These are healthy looking hair cells, and they um, transfer the sound waves via the auditory nerve 
eventually to the brain. Um, but due to certain types of uh, cancer treatments, the hair cells can become damaged. And then they look like this. So you can imagine that hearing function will decrease. So you may think, why is it so relevant to address autotoxicity? Well, we know now that it's an early toxicity indicating that it develops during treatment. Especially in young children, it can lead, lead to impaired speech and language development. This can result in decreased communication skills, uh, impaired educational performance, and problems with socio-emotional behavior. Overall, it can have a severe negative impact on the quality of life of children with cancer and survivors. In 2014, we established a close collaboration with the University Medical Center in Utrecht called the Onco Autotoxicity Consortium, consisting of Professor Stokroos, who is uh, ENT specialist at the UMC Utrecht, uh, Dr. Van Grotel, pediatric oncologist in the Maxima, Dr. Alex Hoetink, uh, audiologist, and uh, Professor Van Heuvel and myself. And uh, we mainly focus on identifying patients at high risk for autotoxicity. And we also aim to optimize quality of care. Our ultimate goal is to prevent this disease as much as possible in the future. So we gained some important insights from um, studies performed by my predecessor, Eva Clemens. Um, we know, for example, that autotoxicity occurs in up to 50% of children treated with cisplatinum. We know that um, hearing function after cisplatinum treatment decreases over time. It eventually stabilizes, but no recovery is observed. And this indicates that um, hearing loss is irreversible. Risk factors we identified were high dose cisplatinum, a young age diagnosis, and also co-treatment with furosemide. She also compared um, classification systems for uh, hearing loss, and she observed that Munster detects uh, hearing loss the earliest in time. Genetic variation may also play a role with regard to hearing loss development. And with an international group of experts, um, she developed a guideline for autotoxicity monitoring uh, after childhood cancer therapy for survivors, including the high risk groups, the choice of audiological tests, and the timing of audiological referral. So overall, I think it's um, I think we know a lot already, but um, more research needs to be done. And that is why today uh, I would like to present to you an overview of novel insights on clinical and genetic determinants associated with autotoxicity in children with cancer and survivors. First, I would like to focus on the course and risk factors of hearing loss development during childhood cancer treatment. So um, we did this study in a cohort of Canadian childhood cancer patients. They had two or more audiological assessments available within three years after start of cisplatinum. Um, we excluded patients with pre-existing hearing loss and only selected uh, measurements who were uh, reliable. The children received age-appropriate tests, uh, including tympanometry, autoacoustic emissions, and pure tone audiometry. The degree of cisplatinum-induced hearing loss was graded according to the SIOP criteria. And here you can see that SIOP grade two or more reflects relevant hearing loss. Uh, by use of the Kaplan-Meier method, we estimate, estimated the cumulative incidence of hearing loss development over time from baseline to three years after treatment. By using Cox regression analysis, we explored the effect of independent variables over time. Um, and these variables included patient specific variables such as sex and age at start of treatment, but also um, different types of cancer treatments, including the total cumulative dose of cisplatinum and carboplatinum at different time points during treatment, and also treatment with vincristine and cranial irradiation. Um, other variables we selected were um, uh, related to supportive care, uh, such as the total duration of autotoxic tobramycin, gentamicin, and vancomycin administration, and co-treatment with furosemide. 
Um, so the um, results show that um, uh, in the 368 patients who were available, we had more than uh, 2000 audiological assessments available for the analysis. Most of the, them were performed during and after treatment. Here you can see that the cumulative incidence um, increases uh, quite rapidly in the first few months after start of treatment, reaching up to about 28% uh, uh, at six months after start of cisplatinum. And it eventually at three years after start of treatment, the cumulative incidence is approximately 60%. We did an analysis per uh, age category, and um, we observed some striking differences. So in the first six months uh, after start of cisplatinum, we see for the uh, very young children, a very steep increase uh, in the incidence of hearing loss, reaching up to 40%. And then it gradu gradually increases um, to approximately 75% at three years after start of treatment. And in the older ones, you can see a lower and more graduate increase over time. We also did an analysis for tumor type. Um, and here you can see that uh, especially patients, uh, sorry, especially patients with uh, liver tumors had a very high incidence of hearing loss development over time, reaching 80% at two years after start of cisplatinum. And also uh, patients with um, uh, neuroblastoma and uh, CNS tumors had a high uh, incidence of hearing loss. The results of Cox regression analysis show that, well, obviously age is a risk factor for hearing loss development over time, but also uh, the total cumulative dose of cisplatinum at three months during treatment plays a role, um, treatment with vincristine, and also the duration of uh, combined administration of autotoxic antibiotics. So you may think, okay, but what's the mechanism uh, behind these outcomes? Well, um, it's, it's um, not clear yet, but we know from young children that um, their central auditory pathway and uh, hair cell innervation continue to um, develop uh, throughout the first years of life. And um, these developing structures may be more uh, vulnerable to the toxic effect of cisplatinum. We also know that long-term retention of cisplatinum in the cochlea may be more pronounced in young children. It's also important to be aware that, um, for example, patients with liver tumors are uh, very young uh, at time of diagnosis. So uh, age and tumor type are also co correlated. With regard to vincristine, um, uh, its toxic effect is very limitedly reported in a few case studies and re recently once on a larger scale. Mechanism is not clear, but we think that um, as vincristine has a neurotoxic effect, that it um, might affect the auditory nerve. And I can also imagine that innervation of hair cells can become affected. So um, with regard to the aminoglycosides and glycopeptides, um, their single autotoxic effect is questionable, um, but um, it's, their effect may, may be more pronounced when they are administered in parallel uh, in combination with cisplatinum and also with loop diuretics. So it is really important to be aware of this. And also um, genetic predisposition may play a role because we know that patients with a variant in the mtRNA1 gene uh, may be more at risk for aminoglycoside induced hearing loss, um, especially Spanish and Chinese patients. Our second topic is on genetic predisposition for hearing loss in cisplatinum-treated children. So a little bit of background on genetic variation, you might already know this, um, but I would like to, um, well, um, tell a little bit about this before we uh, dive into the subject. Um, so uh, uh, we have, uh, humans have uh, 23 uh, chromosome uh, pairs consisting of DNA and the DNA uh, consists of several nucleotides, including the A, C, G, and T. Um, and a single nucleotide polymorphism, or a SNP, as I would I call it from now on, is a, a variant in a nucleotide 
occurring at a specific um, location across the genome. So for example, here, in, when you look at these patients, here the uh, A has been replaced by AG. So SNPs occur naturally, and um, they often do not have an effect on health, but sometimes they do. Um, and then it, um, they can contribute to the development of certain diseases. And we think that this may also be the case in ototoxicity. Um, what we know is that patients who are treated with um, similar types of uh, chemotherapy, chemotherapeutic agents and um, similar doses of cisplatinum and carboplatinum um, may not uh, have uh, may may not have uh, ototoxicity um, to the um, no sorry. Um, ototoxicity occurrence can, occurrence can be different in these uh, patients. Um, and then that's why we think that genetic predisposition um, plays a role here. So we ask ourselves the question, do those children with hearing loss after cisplatinum treatment have uh, genetic changes more often than expected? And you can investigate this by two different methods, uh, such as a, uh, the Canada gene approach in which you investigate the known SNPs and um, a genome-wide association study where you investigate new SNPs. Because it would be very important to um, gain better insights, because if we know this, then we can maybe use this knowledge to optimize treatment eventually. So basically, the candidate gene approach, um, you select patients with hearing loss, the cases, and patients without hearing loss, the controls. Um, you obtain their DNA, um, either by uh, either blood or saliva. And then by using uh, Tagman analysis, you um, compare differences in the DNA to discover known SNPs based on the literature that are um, uh, associated with autotoxicity. The genome-wide association study um, also requires patients with hearing loss as case, cases and patients without hearing loss as the controls. And then uh, you use their, uh, uh, you obtain the DNA and then by use of arrays, you compare differences in the DNA to discover novel SNPs associated with autotoxicity. And we, um, uh, we apply both approaches in the Penker Life study. This is a EU FP7 funded project. Um, and the study consists of a large cohort of childhood cancer patients. Um, study focused on fertility, autotoxicity, and also quality of life. And consists of eight different work packages. In work package five, we applied a Canada gene approach. And in work package 4B, we performed uh, a GWAS study. And here in the picture, you can see uh, all the countries that participated. Um, so here you can see the differences uh, with regard to inclusion criteria between um, both work packages. Um, work package five uh, did not have um, any restrictions with regards to um, chemotherapy treatment and cranial irradiation. So both treatment with cisplatinum and carboplatinum um, treated patients were um, eligible. And um, here in work package 4B, we applied stricter uh, inclusion criteria. So only uh, patients were eligible with initial treatment with cisplatinum um, who did not receive cranial irradiation, and uh, they needed to have a pure tone audiogram available within two years after end of treatment. From these patients, we collected um, demographic, diagnostic treatment, and audiometric data. And the diagnosis of hearing loss was based on uh, outcomes of pure tone audiograms measured up to eight kilohertz. Uh, hearing loss was graded according to independent assessors, and uh, they were blinded to the patient's characteristics. Hearing loss was graded according to the Munster criteria, and um, Munster grade 2B or more uh, reflects relevant hearing loss in this case. In work package 5, we uh, performed the candidate uh, gene study. Um, we selected genes that are 
suggested to be involved in hearing loss based on the literature. So these are mentioned here. And as you can see, most of them were, um, uh, select, uh, were investigated by a candidate gene approach and only two studies, uh, in only two studies, a genome wide association study was performed. Um, in two studies, um, actually, the um, variant in the gene had a protective effect on hearing loss development. But in most studies, um, the variants induced a uh, higher risk of hearing loss development in patients. So um, several mechanisms for um, uh, uh, were described in these papers for hearing loss development. Um, for example, certain genes are involved in um, transport of cis platinum out of the cell. Um, another one has a critical role in hair cell development. Other genes are involved in um, drug metabolism and detoxification. And uh, other ones are a play a role in protection of cochlear cells from uh, reactive oxygen species induced by cis platinum. And also uh, other ones, um, from other ones, we know that they are highly expressed in the inner ear cells. The results from the Canada gene approach um, showed that there was no association observed between the uh, identified, uh, between the known SNPs and uh, hearing loss developments in 344 patients. And that was why we decided to perform a meta-analysis. So with um, a combined analysis, including results of previous studies. We, 22 separate studies were um, selected and they included almost uh, 3,000 subjects. And they were treated with uh, platinum uh, or uh, cranial and or cranial radiotherapy. And the studies were performed in children, adults, or in both. And here you can see that a variant in the ACIP2 gene was involved with hearing loss development. ACIP2 stands for acylphosphatase 2. Uh, it's highly expressed in the cochlea, and we know that it has an effect on uh, calcium homeostasis. And calcium is actually very important uh, for hair cell development. And you can imagine that this regulation in this case can lead to severe damage. And in work package for B, we performed the GWAS. Um, so after you obtain the DNA from the patients, you perform genotyping, uh, quality control, imputations, and then you perform your analysis. And thereafter, um, your results are visualized in plots. For example, this is a, a so-called Manhattan plot. Here on the x-axis, you can see the different chromosomes. And on the y-axis, the minus log 10 p-value. And you can um, choose two options. So you can uh, select uh, SNPs, either if you have small sample size, you choose a suggestive significant uh, threshold. It's usually one times 10 to the minus five, or in case of a large cohort, you use the genome-wide significance threshold of uh, five times 10 to the minus eight. And then um, you select uh, these SNPs and you, you can send them for replication. And thereafter, a meta-analysis uh, of the results is performed, or you choose the other option where you can where you combine um, both both GWASs together and then perform a meta-analysis. Um, we had 390 patients available in our discovery cohort, and 43% of them had relevant hearing loss. Um, they had a median age of diagno uh, a diagnosis of 11.1 years. Um, and uh, as you can see, uh, more than half of them were treated for osteosarcomas. Um, the results from our discovery cohort showed that um, we selected eight uh, SNPs with a su suggestive significant threshold. Um, and they are depicted here below the red line. One SNP in the TSARC one like gene was replicated in an independent, independent cohort of Canadian childhood cancer patients who received similar treatments. Um, and this uh, variant was sent for a second replication to a European cohort of 
uh, childhood cancer patients. Here below, you can see the forest plot that we created and the re uh, combined results of the cohorts showed that patients who carry a variant in TSRC1 like have a 3.11 fold increased odds of hearing loss compared to patients who do not carry this variant. So the next step was to apply annotation of um, the gene that we found. Um, little evidence of, yeah, little evidence was available, um, but we noticed uh, in one article that um, it uh, might be involved in expression uh, uh, in the cochlea and brain of mice. So we decided to pursue functional validation experiments of TSRC1 like, and we did this in HALA cell lines and in mouse tissue. We focused on um, the influence of uh, on site toxicity and uh, inflammatory response. And here you can see the results. So in this graph on the X axis, you can see the cis platinum dose, and on the Y axis, the cell viability. Basically, what we noticed is that overexpression of TSRC1 like actually protected cells from cisplatinum toxicity and silencing induced the opposite effect. So it uh, made cells more, vul more vulnerable to the toxic effect of cisplatinum. Overexpression uh, caused a reduction in IL-8 secretion where silencing induced uh, IL-8 secretion actually. We also did some experiments in mouse tissue in the liver, kidney, spleen, and lung. And here you can see that uh, uh, TSR1 like was uh, well, highly expressed in the spleen and in the lung, and to a lesser extent in the kidney and the liver. And uh, also here you see the inverse correlation where um, TSR1 like is highly expressed, IL6 expression is very low. And, um, where TSRC1 like is um, not really expressed, IL6 uh, expression is quite high. Our next topic is on uh, hearing loss surveillance during childhood cancer therapy. Uh, in 2019, um, we, uh, within the group, we developed uh, a, a guideline for autotoxicity surveillance after childhood cancer treatment for childhood cancer survivors. Uh, under the umbrella of the International Guideline Harmonization Group. Um, however, no guideline existed on other toxicity monitoring during childhood cancer treatment. There are quite some challenges with monitoring during therapy. For example, awareness and motivation for monitoring are often lacking in clinical practice. Um, but it's, it's quite understandable because there's really no homogeneity in recommendation uh, in recommendations uh, for testing across protocols. Here we see an overview of frequently used uh, cancer treatment protocols during childhood cancer therapy. And I would like to show you some, um, well, remarkable uh, recommendations. For example, this one, uh, the ACNS 0332 protocol uh, for medulloblastoma treatment. Um, this includes a recommendation that is quite complete, starting from uh, a baseline audiogram to uh, follow-ups, uh, follow-up um, measurements uh, many years after end of treatment. But also this one in a protocol for the high-grade gliomas uh, mentions that in case of carboplatinum treatment, hearing tests should be regularly performed if possible. So this is not very specific. And also when you look at the uh, protocols for germ cell tumors, the American protocol uh, over here and the European protocol over here have different recommendations included. Also, uh, the protocols do not um, mostly, uh, most often do not specify the, uh, the tests that should be performed according to age category. Um, many do not include any recommendations for the avoidance of uh, co medication use, such as the aminoglycosides and the loop diuretics. And many people think that um, monitoring of hearing function is only important if you can adjust um, chemotherapy treatment. Um, but, well, this is not always the case and should be done with caution, and it really depends on the specific patient's 
uh, on a specific, specific patient and individual uh, and the disease that um, we're dealing with. So overall, the outcomes of the studies as performed so far are very difficult to compare. That was why we um, decided to develop a guideline for autotoxicity monitoring during childhood cancer treatment. It all started in, a, uh, in our core group and we developed an inventory on the challenges of uh, testing during treatment. Um, and these were presented during the SIAB Europe conference in 2019. Thereafter, we developed some study questions, uh, including age-appropriate testing and the timing and frequency of testing during treatment. We did a literature review, including uh, clinical practice guidelines uh, and treatment protocols. And we noticed that the evidence was quite scarce. And that was why we decided to apply a consensus-based strategy. We established the Autotoxicity Task Force, consisting of international experts in the field of audiology and pediatric oncology. And they represented different geographic areas. With them, we held multiple video conferences to discuss and eventually reach consensus on several statements. And we are very happy that and grateful that uh, our paper was eventually published under the umbrella of the Cyber Supportive Care Committee. So um, we uh, based the risk groups for hearing loss development on uh, the previous, uh, previous developed guideline. And these include patients treated with cisplatinum, high dose carboplatinum, cranial irradiation, and uh, CNS surgery or CSF shunt. With audiological experts, we um, discussed question one on the diagnostic tests per age category. We developed a standardized test battery and also included optional tests that can be performed in time and if time and logistics permit. Overall, we recommend case history at baseline and um, we recommend to perform a check of the middle ear, inner ear function and presence of tinnitus at each follow-up. And we developed this flow diagram specifically per age category. Um, so, uh, here you start with the age of the child, and then you follow the arrows to the tests that can be performed to screen the middle ear function by using otoscopy and tympanometry, uh, and the inner ear function by use of autoacoustic emissions. And then to quantify the type and severity of hearing loss, you can test the brain stem responses in, uh, in the infants, visual reinforcement audiometry uh, in uh, toddlers, Condition, condition play audiometry is applicable in children aged three to five years. And standard pure tone audiometry um, is uh, always performed in children aged five to 18 years. So the pediatric oncologists uh, represent as relevant international tumor groups, including CNS tumors, osteosarcoma, germ cell tumors, renal tumors, retinoblastoma, hepatoblastoma, neuroblastoma, and also supportive care and toxicity. With them, we discussed question two, um, including the pros and cons of monitoring and the timing and frequency of testing. So we state that surveillance during treatment is very important to identify a change in hearing status and to provide supportive counseling and audiological interventions if, ne interventions if necessary. Um, it's important to mention that, um, that, uh, that, treatment, uh, that cancer treatments cannot always be adjusted. It highly depends on the individual patient and specific disease. And we developed uh, this table with the timing and frequency of monitoring on the x-axis and the risk factors on the y-axis. Basically, we always recommend to perform a baseline and end of treatment measurement. In case of um, intermediate and high doses cisplatinum and high dose carboplatinum, we state that testing at each cycle should be considered. In patients who receive carboplatinum in intermediate doses, uh, testing at each alternating cycle is optional. <clears throat> and also in patients who receive cranial radiation and brain surgery, a measurement after the procedure is optional. The experts stated that um, 
uh, other high risk indications are uh, patients uh, who have pre existing hearing loss or, or who have um, uh, hearing loss in the family. Um, and preferably, they should also be measured at each cycle during tre treatment. So, my last uh, topic I would like to address is tinnitus. Tinnitus is the perception of a phantom sound in the ear or head. It's usually subjective. And this indicates that it can only be perceived by the person who is affected by it. It can be a single sound or it can be a combination of sounds. And it's important to be aware that many, in many patients, this sound is constantly present. So um, hearing loss monitoring is now becoming more and more part of standard care uh, during and after childhood cancer treatment. But there was no major attention for tinnitus so far. And um, standardized screening in the clinic and late effect clinics was not performed. And also knowledge on its prevalence and risk factors were lacking. That is why first we performed a systematic literature research. Uh, we selected, uh, uh, we used terms including uh, childhood cancer tinnitus and uh, cancer treatment. We identified 740 articles uh, and eventually selected 10 of, 10 of them. Um, in uh, the prevalence of tinnitus at follow-up ranged between 3 to 60 percent in all studies, but we performed a risk of bias assessment, and in the studies of adequate quality, the prevalence ranged between 3 to 17 percent. Prognostic factors were scarcely reported in only in four studies, and they suggest that platinum, cranial radiation, and age at diagnosis may play a role. <clears throat> Uh, so overall, there was high variability between the studies, and this indicated that more research was needed. And uh, this is our um, uh, second study uh, in the, performed in the Dutch uh, later cohort, a uh, large cohort of childhood cancer survivors uh, who were all diagnosed before the age of 18 years, treated between 1964 and 2002. They were alive five years or more after diagnosis. And they completed a general health questionnaire between 2010 and 2018. And they were also asked to invite their siblings to complete the sim a similar questionnaire. And they serve as the control group for the study. Tinnitus was self-reported in the questionnaire. Uh, and um, the question included if patients uh, have had ringing in the ears or do you currently have this condition? Prognostic factors were... Um, uh, obtained from the uh, from the later database, and they include cancer subtype, gender, HI diagnosis, and also uh, chemotherapy, radiotherapy, and surgery related variables. The statistics we performed were generalized estimated equations to estimate the odds rate ratio of tinnitus in survivors compared to siblings, and we performed multivariate logistic regression analysis to explore the effect of independent variables. Um, in total, uh, more than 2,900 survivors and more than 1,000 siblings completed the questionnaire. Tinnitus occurred in 9.5% of the survivors and 3.7% of siblings. And this indicates that survivors have a threefold increased odds of tinnitus. From approximately 50% of them, we had information available on the median age of tinnitus onset, and this was 25 years. Um, most often the survivors suffered from osteosarcoma and CNS tumors. Clinical risk factors we identified were an older age of diagnosis, cisplatinum dose um, uh, more than 400 milligrams per square meter, cranial radiation and brain surgery. However, we noticed that these treatment modalities were applied in 50% of the survivors, and this indicates that other risk factors may play a role. For an in-depth search of uh, risk factors, we uh, performed several additional analysis, also one in the sub-cohort of ALL survivors. Tinnitus occurred in 8% of them and in 3% of their siblings. We noticed that cranial radiation and total body irradiation uh, were risk factors for tinnitus uh, in this subgroup. However, uh, it was, they were only applied in 44% um, of them. So we really think it's important for future ALL studies to focus on identifying novel risk factors um, in this uh, patient population. 
So, um, as I mentioned, um, cisplatinum destructs uh, hair cells in the inner ear. And this can actually lead to a decreased neural output to the central auditory system. Um, what we see with regard to tinnitus development is that a uh, misbalance develops between inhibition and excitation of neurons. And this can actually lead to upregulated activity with increased firing rates of the neurons observed. And eventually changes in the auditory cortex can develop and this can lead to the perception of a phantom sound. Cranial irradiation has, um, an, can have an effect on um, the outer ear, the middle ear, and uh, also on the inner ear, the hair cells specifically. It can also induce vascular degeneration, and it can affect the auditory nerve. In our study, the effect of dose was unclear. Also, in other studies, there was no consensus about a cutoff point uh, at which tinnitus may develop. That is why we think the symmetry studies are needed. And um, uh, the last uh, clinical risk factor is, um, can be the CNS tumor itself by infiltration in the auditory structures, but can also be related to surgery. Um, uh, resection may lead to damage and also um, can, tinnitus can also develop due to the placement of a CSF shunt. So to conclude, uh, young children are an important risk group, and we think it's important to consider close or closer audiological monitoring during treatment. Genetic susceptibility is of influence, but we, we need more research on a larger scale uh, before uh, genetic testing can eventually be implemented. We highly recommend to perform standardized monitoring during treatments. It's important for early detection, counseling, and applying interventions. And survivors are at higher risk of tinnitus compared to controls. Um, and we think it's important to consider implementation of tinnitus screening during and after treatment. Some future directions. Um, we, uh, for the future, we need prospective studies and large national cohorts. Princess Maxima Center, uh, our PhD student Romy Diepstraat is currently performing the sound study. Um, in which we test the feasibility of our consensus recommendations for monitoring. And it's also important um, to identify novel clinical risk factors. With regard to genetics, uh, more research, uh, preferably on an international scale, is needed to uh, develop polygenic risk scores in the future for stratification of patients. We also aim to um, identify the role of mitochondrial DNA variants methylation status and biomarkers. We aim to focus on follow-up studies in tinnitus, uh, mainly on quality of life and genetics. And we aim to design an optimal approach for hearing preservation, either by systemic or local preventative agents. I would like to thank all collaborators on this slide for the uh, pleasant collaboration. I would like to thank you uh, on behalf of uh, our research group for your attention, and we will be happy to answer uh, any questions. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Enelet Major, for this very wonderful lecture. And now I would like to invite Professor Mary van der Heuvel Abram first uh, for her. Will you be showing slides also, or we will listen to your comments, Professor van der Heuvel Abram? Yeah, I, I, I have given on a lot um, the, the opportunity to use the full time so okay. because um, the work has really been done by her together with us. <clears throat> so um, I'm happy to uh, help answering any questions, but um, I, I, so the full time yeah. has nearly been used, but uh, I think it's, it's good that she presented it herself. Thank you so much. It was really very wonderful. And we have a lot of questions, but before the questions, we would like to have uh, some comments or some uh, take home messages to summarize the uh, very important topic. Uh, maybe we will ask you first, uh, Professor van der Heuvel Ebrink, to just uh, reinforce or emphasize. Now we, we have participants from 32 countries at the moment. So it is a very important uh, topic, autotoxicity. So we would like to emphasize some topics when, to, when uh, the risk factors like age, the cisplatinum dose, the radiotherapy has been said, but the take home messages, what to do. 
And if, like, for example, for low middle income countries, it is, is it convenient or it may not be very easy to do it before every uh, course of chemotherapy, but is it okay for every two courses or at least we, we have seen the cis platinum dose, but when to be more careful? Would you like to comment on those? And then after that, I'll also like to take the comments of a very experienced uh, colleague, uh, Professor Brock also, and then Marianne, yes, please. Yeah, so thank you for the opportunity. I think, um, first of all, I would like to stress the fact that we should be aware. And I think we as pediatric oncologists are so uh, busy with treating patients and curing them that um, we really, even in our beautiful center, have to make our colleagues aware of the fact that autotoxicity is a very important uh, side effect. The second thing is that um, this is a direct side effect, not a late side effect. So it, it happens already when you treat your patients. And then the third thing is that uh, when this um, hearing loss occurs, it's irreversible. So you cannot cure it, you cannot change it. So when it happens, it's, uh, it's definite. And that's what, that was what we were shocked about. And also the frequency is rather high, especially in the patients with platinum. Um, the last thing I think is that we should really pay attention to the very young children. And I'm happy that we now at least have a, um, a guideline how to test these young children. But what we now come across in this uh, same supportive care group of the SIOP, we are discussing uh, when you test these young children with the, um, with the devices that have been recommended in the YAM oncology paper, it's sometimes really difficult how to phrase what you find. So when do you call it hearing loss? When do you call it cochlear impairment? And this, this group has, um, well, has taken this effort forward to really make standard recommendations on how we define um, that patient uh, that may be at risk for really developing hearing loss. Because also the conditions under which you uh, test, but also the, the, uh, the frequency on which you, which you test are very important if you uh, use autoacoustic emissions instead of audiograms. Because when you use tone audiograms, um, I think they're, they're a nice classification, whether you use a Pepe's classification or Minster or Syop, but for the uh, autoacoustic emission, it's still very difficult. So there's still a lot to do just on the floor. And, and I think the, the strength of this group is really that we manage to combine efforts of audiologists that are really committed to this field and oncologists that are using a lot of platinum uh, to see how we can improve um, uh, the situation and the conditions. Thank you so much. Before the questions, I would like also to take the comments of Professor Pepe Brock. And then uh, just uh, for our participants, we, can, we still, although it is a one hour session, we can extend the session from the technical team has uh, just uh, uh, informed me that we can have 15 to 20 more minutes uh, for the ones that want to uh, stay and uh, ask for the questions and uh, answers. Yes, Dr. Brock. Thank you. First of all, thank you for uh, joining us. Uh, you're, you, are, you are muted. Please unmute. <laughs> Sorry. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. And thank you very much, Professor Brudy, for asking me. And thank you to um, Professor Van den Hervel and to Anna Lott um, and Professor Van der Wettering. It's it's something very, very close to my heart that we, of course, want as pediatric oncologists to cure children of cancer. But what we do with our treatments is unfortunately we cause damage. And I think I want to emphasize what Professor Van den Hervel said is that we need to be helping parents and children to understand what we have done to them and the cost, if you like, of the cure. I am very optimistic and very hopeful that we will have autoprotectants licensed by the end of this year that we can add into the treatment to 
help prevent uh, the hearing loss. However, while we wait, we are at a difficult crossroads where we need to be monitoring and helping parents understand that we cannot always avoid the hearing loss if the child is to be cured. And there are um, remedies that we can put in place to help them manage life better, um, even if they do end up with hearing loss. I think what you were saying, uh, Professor Kaboudi, about in resource challenge nations, it's very important to test a child, I think, at the end of treatment, and particularly when they get to the age of three and a half, four years old, or if they are at that age, when they start school, and be really sure that the school and the parents understand the difficulties that the child has. And so that everybody is supporting the child to learn as well as they can do with the hearing impairment that they have. If everybody understands it better, uh, children will be helped more to have a better life. And then as we work very hard in the background to try and prevent this, um, hopefully in the future, they won't have to have it. Thank you so much. Now we have uh, questions. Uh, uh, Dr. Van de Vettering and I can uh, direct these questions to you. One was from Alexandra Pangarso. Are there any predictors for autotoxin in childhood chemotherapy? And a lot, uh, dear Dr. Enalot has very uh, elegantly told about this, right? Uh, would you like to emphasize again, uh, Dr. Enalot, uh, the age, I think the predictors for autotoxicity, yeah. The yeah, yeah. Adaptive. Yeah, age is definitely uh, a, a huge predictor, uh, those aged five years and younger. Um, and yeah, obviously the total cumulative dose of cisplatinum, um, uh, the higher the dose, uh, well, it, 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 it mainly, well, it can, it can uh, obviously occur in lower doses, but the risk increases in higher doses. So um, yeah, I think I, yeah, well, I told a lot about the predictors during my presentation. So, but I think if I have to choose, then then age and total cumulated dose of cisplatinum are the most important uh, ones. And also, I think we shall emphasize you have uh, also shown that the use of uh, aminoglycosides and yeah. glucopeptides, because as support, if people interested in supportive care in febrile neutropenia, we nowadays for maybe more than ten years emphasize the importance of monotherapy, the yeah. one only one antibiotic that covers most of it and to avoid aminoglycosides. So maybe we can emphasize that also here. Uh, and in some patients, we, we may have to use it because of the microbiological results, but for empirical febrile neutropenia treatment, we shall not use aminoglycosides nor glycopeptides mm -hmm. if we don't have microbiological evidence to use that. Uh, if, if they're in a septic shock or if they have a microbiological uh, result that we need to use, we shall, but otherwise we shall avoid it. Maybe this, this is also a message because yeah. we are using the other, auto, uh, the other. In some patients, we cannot. Uh, we want to uh, serve the survival, a high survival rate. So, as uh, Dr. Brock said, we have to use sometimes taking into account that we will have uh, the hearing loss, but yeah, maybe definitely. we can avoid these antibiotics. Yeah. Uh, one another question. Uh, and there are many thanks to all of uh, to all the presentations and comments. Dr. Baruch Yilmaz has asked what should be the safety time interval between radiotherapy, especially in CNS tumors or head, head and neck tumors, uh, and the ototoxic chemotherapy to protect ototoxicity. Is there such an interval uh, or is this interval important or is it just the cumulative effects? Whenever you use it, it will uh, add to the ototoxicity. I would like the comment of uh, the, the three experts that are here, yeah. Um, I think it's a very good question and an important one. Um, as far as I'm concerned, there are no, um, well, studies that, that really looked into this. Um, so I, I don't feel comfortable with stating an interval here. Um, Pepe, do you know anything, uh, anything about I this? Think 
the information that we have about radiotherapy dates back to the 1980s, um, before your time and a lot, but Rick Wilmer <laughs> um, presented um, a, a study where it was clear, sadly, that if you give radiotherapy before cisplatin, you get worse ototoxicity. Now, the challenge there is that nearly all the treatment protocols that treat children give the radiotherapy first. And so sadly, I think we can't describe an interval. Um, what we do advise is that there's at least six weeks between radiotherapy and start of cisplatin, but I think that is for other reasons, not just uh, ototoxicity. So sadly, we do appreciate that children with CNS tumors that have radiotherapy that affects the auditory pathway and need to have cisplatin um, do get nasty uh, hearing loss. I think the methods and the improvements in radiotherapy techniques are hopefully going to help. But if the auditory pathway needs to be included, it needs to be included. So these are really difficult um, questions to answer. And I think there is no safe uh, limit. Dr. Sania Baiturova has asked, how can I receive recommendations that you mentioned? Maybe we can tell them about the publication that appeared in uh, JAMA Oncology of yeah. the recommendations for age-appropriate testing, timing, and frequency of oncological <coughs> monitoring during childhood cancer treatment, uh, which was, this is also support, uh, endorsed by the SIOP Supportive Care, the consensus report. Yeah. Uh, I think we can... Uh, you agree also, right? That yeah, yeah, yeah. Advice yeah, it's... Tania and our uh, participants about this publication and the other publications that you mentioned. Yeah, uh, it's so in the uh, it's in the September 21, uh, 2021 issue of Yama Oncology. Yama Oncology. I'm happy yes. to provide a link in the chat uh, after uh, we're finished. So um... yeah, okay, that will be good. I think. Uh, so... That was Sanya. Dr. Gurses Shahin has asked, in your study, did you check mitochondrial polymorphic gene structure or does it have any effect? Yeah, that's, that's a very, I, I really like this question. Uh, no, we did not, <laughs> but we actually are setting up a study to investigate mitochondrial uh, uh, gene variants. So um, yeah, I can't, well, we don't have any results yet, but we're very busy with this because uh, we know that mitochondrial variants occur in the general population um, and, and are linked to uh, late onset of hearing loss and also play a role in amino of glycoside induced hearing loss. So we are very curious to see if this plays a role in ototoxicity as well. Yeah. Dr. Gurses Shahin has also asked, what were the relation between uh, CN CNPs and cisplatin toxicity? I think you mentioned some of this. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I yeah I mentioned it in the it was in the one with the um, with the graphs uh, where I explained uh, this I am happy to do it again but um, okay. maybe you can look back at the slides uh, it's all in there. Dr. Zekia Altun has asked thank you for the excellent presentation in Dokuzela University we are studying uh, ototoxicity I wondered do you have a, a suggestion or test any other type of ototoxicity biomarker <laughs> from blood. In Dokuzer Eyl University, Dr. Nur Olgun, uh, who is also the coordinator of the neuroblastoma study, his husband and also his son is a very uh, experienced uh, otolaryngologist and they do a lot of ototoxicity uh, trials, uh, also translational uh, trials. Mm -hmm. And the question from, it is from her team, from a colleague from the, her team, if we have any biomarker that we can look at the, on the, in the blood uh, or in the serum uh, for ototoxicity. And the second question was uh, for, from them is, uh, do you use any protective agents to prevent cisplatin reduced ototoxicity? So first let's uh, ask, do we have any biomarkers for ototoxicity that we can look in the serum or blood? Yeah, definitely. Well, um, uh, I, I also really like this question because uh, this is also something we uh, aim to uh, investigate. I looked into this actually, and um, there are uh, two studies performed in um, guinea pigs, and they focus on the role of prestin. Mm -hmm. This is an uh, um, this is an amino of an, um, uh, a protein. Sorry, a protein that um, uh, occurs in the in the in the ear, and uh, this can be detected in blood. So um, we uh, aim to uh, study this in. Uh, blood from, from patients as well in the, in the future. 
Yeah. The other question, both from uh, the same Zeki Altun and also from Nasreen, Mohammed Khalifa, is on the role of protective agents. Yeah. And I th there was a, a publication for, in whom Lillian Sang and Lee Dipui from our supportive care also were co-authors on the prevention of cisplatin-induced autotoxicity in children and adolescents, a clinical practice guideline, where they had a table for amifostin and the other uh, uh, protective agents that, uh, especially in the hepatoblastoma trial has been used, maybe uh, Dr. Brock also will tell about it. Could you please comment on those I mean, for amifostin and also the other bio, uh, protective agents? You want me to, Anna? Yes, yeah, I mean, you're the expert, so please. <laughs> I'm talking I'm so much already, so please go ahead. <laughs> I'm happy to. So, um, the St. Jude's uh, presented on amifostine in standard risk medulloblastoma. And I think St. Jude's have been using uh, amifostine in that group of patients. It is not without toxicity. Um, and then there are the two papers that have been published on sodium bisulfate autoprotection. The one on children with hepatoblastoma that I published in the New England Journal of Medicine with all my colleagues, and the one from David Fryer that was published the year before in Lancet Oncology. Um, there is a compassionate use program open for sodium bisulfate, and you are welcome to contact to get sodium bisulfate until it is licensed. We are expecting it to be licensed for all localized disease by the end of the year. Um, but you can obtain it once your country is um, geared up to getting it from the company for all children with localized disease. We are going to need to do some studies in metastatic disease um, before it will be licensed for metastatic disease. And it is, of course, these children that need it the most. But hopefully all of that will follow in the, in the coming years. There are not at the moment other products that are really secure, um, but other products are coming through the system. And so hopefully we will have different products available in a few years time, but that doesn't help the children for today. For the sodium thiosulfate, so it is, at, uh, you have shown that in uh, non-metastatic hepatoblastoma, it doesn't uh, decrease survival and it does yeah. help auto it yes. prevent autotoxicity. Yes. For metastatic, uh, it is not, as you have mentioned, not for metastatic because the, we don't have the results yet or? It, basically what happened was the American study chose children with all types of tumors. They were not allocated according to prognostic factors. It was a randomized study only for hearing. And at the end of the study, they decided to do a post hoc analysis and divided patients into those that had localized disease and those that had metastatic disease. In fact, what they showed was children with localized disease, it was the same outcome, same survival, but children with metastatic disease, those that got the STS had an unusually positive outcome. So about 80% of those children with metastatic disease survived. And the children with STS, about 50% of them survived. So actually the children with STS had a normal outcome for metastatic disease. But at the time, pediatric oncologists were so nervous of this drug that what they concluded was that children with STS got a lower outcome. So I am convinced having seen more of the data that actually this is to do with the prognostic variables and therefore we just have to prove that it is safe in metastatic disease in the future for it to be used. But currently we cannot ask um, the FDA or the EMA to license it for metastatic disease as yet. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I think, uh, so there are many thanks to all of you. And I think these are the questions. So with this, I would like to uh, thank uh, our guest speakers, Professor Mary van der Heuvel, I bring, and I thank you a lot, Mary, because you had another international meeting today and an unexpected one. And uh, still by changing the time you were able to uh, be with us, that is very uh, important. Thank you so much. We thank Dr. Anna Lot Major for her very nice presentation and very important uh, 
lecture and information. We thank uh, dear uh, Marianne van der Wettering. I think she had to leave for co-moderating uh, the session with me. And also we thank Professor Pepe Brock for uh, being with us and uh, because and uh, ex with telling and commenting with her very uh, wide experience in autotoxicity. And also we thank all the participants with, for that were here with us. Uh, the, as I said, there were 30, uh, participants from 32 countries and we hope that this information will be helpful to them and in consequence to the children with cancer in all these countries. And also I would like to thank the Dr. Club for the technical assistance that they give. They, have, they give this technical assistance free uh, for us, for the children with cancer in all the world. Thank you so much uh, to Dr. Club and also to the Istanbul University Oncology Institute that, that is providing this seminars with me. Thank you so much. Uh, let's you. meet in the next one, in the next seminar next uh, in April. Thank, Thank you so much. much. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. 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 bye.